It's the winter of 1975, and Ted Bundy's got to find a place where there's not a lot of talk about missing women and where he can blend in. So he heads up the mountains to Colorado. He was very you know, familiar with ski resorts in Colorado already. He understood that uh, those places are populated by basically strangers, and he would fit in quite well. He ends up in Aspen. On January 12th, 1975, Karen Campbell disappeared from the Wildwood Inn. Bundy ended up at the Wildwood Inn. Karen Campbell was a nurse from Michigan. She had come to the Wildwood Inn just like a day before. Karen Campbell sat with her fiancé, Dr. Raymond Godowski, in front of a fire in the lobby of the Wildwood Inn. They had just finished dinner. Miss Campbell wanted a magazine from her room. About 8 o'clock in the evening, she caught the elevator to the lobby to the second floor. That was the last time Godowski saw her alive. Bundy's there. And he whacked her in the head. And she was gone. 36 days later, her nude body was found almost three miles away. Two months later, he heads over to Vail and ends up killing 26-year-old ski instructor Julie Cunningham. He was just not going to stop. He had more relationships with dead women by now than living women. It was all about the hunt. Bundy goes on this killing spree across the Northwest, and he kills three women, a 24-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 12-year-old. There was no pattern between Seattle and Utah and Colorado. There was no physical tie to them. There was nothing to uh, loop them all together. In the summer of 1975, Bundy's luck is changing. He was going from being the hunter to being the hunted. In Granger, Utah, it's a small suburb. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. A cop was just getting off duty. His name was Bob Hayward. And he saw this Volkswagen parked in front of a house. He knew there were two young women living there. Then I turned that corner, whop, and I kicked the brick. My lights on bright, and stepped on the gas, and uh, he squirted. It freaks Bundy out, OK? And he, he takes off. Big mistake. So there was a chase. He pulled in the old gas station and stopped. I stopped and opened my door, and he was out and coming back towards me. I pulled my Magnum out and just sit in the crotch of the door. And I said, hold it right there. I said, stand still. When Hayward comes up to the car, he sees that the seat is out. I looked in that side, and this seat was laying in the back seat. And that's quite a space. You could stick a body in it. He says, the seat's broken. He said, I got to get it fixed. OK, do you mind if I look through your car? In his car, he had what we would call burglary tools, the ski mask, pantyhose with the eyes cut out. He had a pair of handcuffs. He says, what do you use handcuffs for? I'm a law student. He says, I use them in my classes. Now, what is a person doing out in the middle of the night in a residential neighborhood with all of those items? And he's driving a Volkswagen buck. Well, I took him in and booked him. I said, there's something wrong with this guy. That put him on the radar of Utah law enforcement, and they had this unsolved abduction of Carol LaRange. I got a call, and it was Ted. He says, I've been arrested. Well, Ted, what were you arrested for? Oh, they think I'm the Ted murderer. And he laughed, and I laughed. I didn't think he was at all guilty. When he came to the police lineup, he made all sorts of attempts to make himself facially difficult to identify. He parted his hair on the other side, so he did have a chameleon-like quality. 
Carol Durange came to the police station, was shown a lineup, and was able to identify Bundy as the person who attacked her. He was arrested and charged with the kidnapping of Carol Durange. He was a likable guy, and if he could be a killer, well, who else might be? So people just didn't want to believe it. I helped raise money to bail him out of jail. Everybody in the ward felt he was innocent. I was assigned Ted Bundy's case by the Office of Public Defense. Ted immediately said something, well, there's this silly little case in Utah. And I kind of, I remember saying, no, it's not a silly little case, Ted. During court proceedings in Utah, Bundy actually comes outside and talks to the media. How do you feel about the justice system in general, based on your <laughs> Well, I'm sure it works, and you've got to have faith it'll work, or else you'd be, you'd be reduced to some kind of, uh, you know, mumbling idiot. Uh, I believe it works. I believe it needs to be improved. When you mention improvements, does that mean uh, ultimately you want to uh, get involved in the criminal justice system? Well, <laughs> yes, I intend to complete my legal education and become a lawyer and uh, be a damn good lawyer. Whether you testify or not is one of the only things the defendant has the sole decision-making power over. And Ted, of course, uh, ignored the advice and testified and was the worst witness in the world. He was an arrogant basically. And that's the way he came across on the stand. At the trial, Durange picked out Bundy as her abductor. I pointed at him, said he was he was the one, he was the man that tried to kidnap me. Ted thought he could lie about everything and get away with it. It's pretty hard to explain why you drive around with an ice pick and a pantyhose mask. Most of us don't have that in our cars. Ted Bundy was convicted with kidnapping Carol DeRoch. Bundy got his verdict that he was guilty. He was going to be headed to a Utah state prison. One way or another, I'm going to find you. Police officers from Utah, Washington State, and Colorado get together, share notes, and determine that they're all talking about the same guy. Everybody knew he was their man. It was just a case of proving it. But he's planning escape.